and I'll share my screen. So welcome everyone. Well, let's uh, go towards the beginning. <laughs> Welcome everyone. Again, just a reminder that we are recording this webinar. Um, so thank you for taking the time to hang out with us today. My name is Fabiola. I am one of the campaign managers with PLUS. And of course, most of you know Jennifer. Jennifer, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi everybody. I'm Jennifer Levin. If I haven't met anybody who's joining here in person yet, um, I am the founder of Caregiver Collective. Um, I started the group a few years ago just collect, to connect millennial caregivers and the group I think you've all noticed keeps growing. We have members from all over the world now and I'm really trying to highlight the issues that millennials face. So Fabiola was awesome um, in her work with Paid Leave US to um, reach out and offer this webinar about how we can be proactive in advocating for ourselves at work when caregiving feels like it gets in the way. Yeah, thank you for that introduction, Jennifer. Um, I'd like to introduce the work that we do at PLUS so that you can get a better understanding of what we do. So we're an advocacy organization and we have one mission, which is to win paid family and medical leave by 2022. Um, essentially, we're working ourselves out of a job. And a couple of years ago, we started this workshop webinar, which is kind of what you're getting today because there was a demand from people to learn how to present paid family proposals at their workplaces, especially from HR leaders and other people who had influence within their jobs. It became um, being able to change the workplace policies became a possibility. So we started offering this, this webinar and um, we'll be sharing some tools and resources today as well. Actually, let's just dive into the agenda. Um, there it is. So we've already done introductions. We'll go through an overview of the paid family, paid family leave landscape. Um, we'll also cover some tools and resources to change paid family leave at your workplace, which I hope is helpful to you all. Um, and then I'll go over some resources and services that caregivers um, can access. I'll also share about some of the advocacy opportunities that people who we work with have had. And then we'll leave most of this time for a Q&A. Um, does that sound good? Yes, Zach, I see your question. Yes. Um, this presentation will be available online. We will have the video saved. Awesome, thanks Jennifer. Also, if um, people have questions, Jennifer, you can totally pause me. I can't see people's comments, so um, please pause me at any time. Sure. Yeah. Cool, well, with that we'll get started. So let's talk about paid family leave. So I mentioned earlier that oftentimes when people think of paid family leave, they think of parental leave. Um, at PLUS, we are really inclusive and wanna make sure that any win, that the win that we're working towards includes family caregiving leave and personal medical leave. Um, we are seeing that a lot of people who are parents are also caregivers, and we have some statistics, which is, sorry, these slides are going really fast, um, that more than 40 million people in the U.S. provide uncompensated care to a loved one each year. And that, that amounts to, for millennials, that's one in four millennials giving uh, caregiving support to a loved one, which is a really large number. Essentially, everyone is going to either give or receive care at some point in our lives. And it's important that we update our policies to reflect the needs of the population. Do you wanna add anything about this? Um, sure, that of the over 10 million millennials that are family caregivers, most of us are employed at a full-time job. Um, and that's why paid family leave affects us so greatly because a lot of people find themselves in a position where they have to cut back hours or um, leave their jobs entirely. Yeah, that's right. Um, other statistics are that an upwards of 75% of all caregivers are female and that they spend as much as 50% of the time providing care. Um, compared to males. We know that this is actually different for millennial generation. And actually, Jennifer, can you speak to that? Because that's a point that you brought up in 
and for this slide specifically. Yeah. Um, millennials are actually changing the landscape of what caregiving looks like in the United States. And for the first time, our generation is almost half men and half women. Um, we're also diverse as far as racial ethnicity goes and as far as having a lot of LGBTQ caregivers as well. Um, all of these which have different aspects when it comes to income equality and um, advocating for yourself at work. Yeah, I mean, that go, that uh, third bullet is linked to that, which is that uh, an AARP report uh, shared that Latinx millennials clock in an average of 42 hours a week compared to 36 hours by other millennial caregivers. So yeah, there are some differences by uh, race, gender, and orientation. Um, and yeah, that's really important to take into consideration when we are proposing a pay family leave law and also policies in the workplace. The other thing that I wanted to say about the millennial caregiver stuff, I'll be, I'll be sharing some stories as we're going along because I like stories. Um, mm -hmm. We're working with, and maybe some of you have heard uh, of caring across generations. Um, and they had this campaign called We Know You Care. And the purpose of that campaign was to highlight the the role of men in caregiving and essentially how damaging it can be to think of caregivers as only female. Um, the person who shared their a video um, of their experience said that because caregiving is very, it can be tailored more towards women, um, the isolation that he experienced was more pronounced. Um, so it's just one thing to also take into consideration when we think of like who will benefit from caregiving leave. Any questions on this slide? Cool. Mm -hmm. Okay, so why are off, uh, companies offering paid family leave policies? Um, well, because it increases employee retention, it helps with talent recruitment, it reinforces company values, and there is improved employee productivity and morale. And we've been seeing this shift happen in the last few years, more than any other years, really. Um, there's a strong case for having paid family policies in the workplace. Um, it really does help employees and it helps employers. So it's a win-win situation. And in a survey earlier last year, uh, paid family leave was selected as a number one like as the top benefit for workers who were looking for a job. 77% um, of workers said that paid family leave could sway them to choose one employer over the other. Um, that's something that we've also encouraged people who have um, done coaching with us is to, when they're negotiating for a job, to ask like, what is your paid family leave policy? Is it equal? Is, does it include caregiving leave? Um, and we've seen that there, that trend is like picking up. So that's, that's good news for, for all of us, really. Anything you wanna add, Jennifer? Um, no, that other than just to build a little bit that um, because it's such an important topic for millennials, talent recruitment and staying competitive is really what is leading a lot of major corporations like Deloitte, Coca-Cola to listen to the millennial prospects and their own millennial employees that are currently there in order to um, offer paid family leave for caregiving so that they remain competitive in the marketplace. Awesome. Great. So one of the things that we've done here at PLUS uh, for I think three years now or two years um, is have this like top employer scorecard. Um, and basically what we do is look at the top 70 employers in the US and that's just, the we define top employers as uh, companies with the most number of employees because that's where we see the impact. Um, and what we're seeing, if you look at the caregiving leave uh, column, is that some companies are, are expanding their caregiving leave policy. Um, so only two companies last year in 2018, late 2018, um, confirmed their caregiving leave policies. We know that there are more, but we wanna make sure that we're getting confirmation from an HR uh, president or vice president or um, the HR person at these companies um, just to make, you know, stay in line with their methodology. But Deloitte is one of those companies, um, the employer that gives 
an equal amount of caregiving leave and parental leave, which is a really, this, I mean, that's an excellent job that they're doing. And I think they've seen the benefits um, from like their employees and like what that's done for their business. Jennifer, would you be able to share some of the other companies that are, that are expanding caregiving leave? Yeah, from what I understand, Johnson & Johnson has um, incorporated caregiving leave in a substantial way in their employee benefits package. And like I mentioned, Coca-Cola did that as a direct result of listening to millennial employees at their company. Yeah, uh, I mentioned earlier that a lot of the folks that we were giving coaching to, providing coaching to, were small to medium-sized companies. And so some of those companies have also expanded their paid family leave policies to include caregiving leave. So, you know, they're not listed in this top employers, but you know, when we see a lot of articles and headlines, like we'll, we'll read things like the top best employers for moms to work at or for like millennials to work out or like the companies that give the best like work-life balance, those kinds of things. So like we wanted to stay in line with that theme and show some of the employers that have the best caregiving and paid family leave policies in general. Okay, so when we're working towards a great paid family policy, well, the bar is really low, sadly. Um, so we want to work towards equality. A lot of corporations um, and large employers will have one policy for corporate employees and a different policy for field employees, hourly, and part-time employees. And that's not something that we want because we know that everyone deserves to be there with their loved ones when it matters most. The other um, element of a good policy is that it has to be enough. And because the US is the only industrialized nation that doesn't have any paid family policy, um, what most uh, employers are pushing for is 12 weeks. We know that we need more, um, but 12 weeks is kind of the baseline. Um, and you know, a lot of them are saying 12 weeks per parental and six weeks for caregiving or medical we would want it to be equal across the board as Deloitte is doing because, you know, every, yeah, it's, we want it to be equal and we want it to be enough and 12 weeks sometimes is just not enough. Also just to uh, piggyback on that a little bit that um, when you are parenting, you know, you obviously would want to capitalize on any parental leave that you're offered, um, but you know that your child will grow up and when you're caregiving, that may be a situation that lasts, you know, years, decades into your future. And so to speak on that, you know, equality as far as the time that you receive, it's something that doesn't really necessarily alleviate in your situation at work. Yeah. And then the third element of a great policy is that it has to be easy to use. I have had countless conversations with people telling me how complicated and messy and confusing even getting FMLA, and FMLA is the Federal Medical Leave Act, even which is not paid, um, and not everyone has access to it, um, is so confusing. Um, I live in California, and our headquarters uh, are here in California for PLUS, and so like I'm most aware of the California Paid Family Leave uh, Program, and um, a lot of research has shown we have seen um, well, California was the first state to implement a paid family program back in 2004. And we see that, yes, people are using it, but there's still a large chunk of the population that's not even aware that the program exists. And people kind of like, as they're applying for it, they kind of give up because it's so confusing and it's so complicated and very bureaucratic. So we want to make sure that it's easy to use as well. Did Fabulous. somebody have a question? Yes, there's one question. Um, are we talking full family pay, uh, paid leave, or supplementing any existing partial, existing partial pay that federal and uh, state programs offer? Yeah, that that's a really good question. So most of the policies that exist, both, I mean, at the state level, um, and right now we only have about eight state, well, seven states and DC that have a paid family leave program. Um, most of them do a percent of wage replacement. So in California last year. The wage replacement increased to 60 to 70 percent. Um, what some companies have done and what we what plus does is that they top up what's missing. So if the state if you're getting 60 percent from the state for the first six weeks, because that's what California's policy is, then a company will top up and top up and 
um, give an additional 40% of the income so that you, people are getting 100% wage replacement that way. But that's actually not the case throughout California. That, that varies by employer um, and that varies by like district and county. We're seeing that New York and New Jersey have like a different, they have a different um, model. And this is where it's interesting uh, for us because you know our goal is to win federally. Um, we want to make sure that whenever states are introducing legislation, that they're moving the needle forward and that they're like basically being com like states are becoming competitive with one another because that's kind of what's going to get us to that win of, I mean, what would be ideal for us would be like six months, fully paid, job protected, expanding the definition of family. Um, and I can talk a little bit more about those details. Um, Actually, I can talk about them now. Yeah, I mean, a lot of one of the reasons why people don't use California's policy or participate in it is because they can't live off of 60% of their wage replacement. They need 100% of their wages. They need a full paycheck. And I think that that's, kind of, that's true across the country. Um, a lot of families are living paycheck to paycheck. One of the things, one of the other reasons people don't take, uh, take a, uh, use the program is because they don't have job protection. Um, so, you know, if you don't have job protection, you're less likely to participate in the program and we want to make sure that people have a job to go back to um, after they take leave. And we recommend six months um, for several reasons, particularly for uh, parental leave. There's research showing that like six months of exclusive breastfeeding is what's best for the child. It also takes quite a long time. It can take a, a while to heal from childbirth. Um, and uh, people still need to go to the doctor and get checked up. And it's a transition period. And I think that six months is inclusive of like people who need caregiving leave as well. Um, the other one, the last thing that we would want or like is to expand the definition of family. And that makes a lot of sense, even like especially for caregivers, I would say, because I've spoken to a lot of people who um, are taking care of an aunt um, or not immediate family, essentially, but they're the only family that they have. And if they're not fitting the definition of what constitutes a family based on the policy, then that means that they can't take time off. And the thing is that in the U.S., like what a family is and looks like is very diverse. It's not always like the nuclear family. Everybody has like grandparents, parents, children. Um, so we really want to expand on that definition so that people who I mean, there are also people who don't have any other family members and they have their friends um, who are like family. So we want to make sure that they're also taken care of in that way. Any questions? Cool. Okay, now let's go through some tools and resources to change paid family leave. Um, here, I keep on moving my screen, but... So here are some of the steps that we recommend for people to win. So one is to find supporters and stories. And I see a question, so I'll pause. Sure. Um, Rachel mentions, I cared for a friend and that was what led me to quit my job. So I can appreciate that. Yeah. Rachel, a great point. Also, um, in some marginalized groups, such as like, we consider marginalized in the US like bisexual orientation or something like that, um, those groups have a higher proportion of people that are caregiving for a friend because their family unit, as Fabiola mentioned, looks different and it may not be um, legal family. So um, that's a great point that you brought up. Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, I'm glad that this is resonating with people. Um, so first is to find supporters and stories and I'll get into the details of that. And then we do this thing with, that's called power mapping. I think a lot of folks may be familiar with this concept. Um, it's pretty basic. And then build your case using bench, benchmarks and customize your template proposal. And you're gonna get, you're gonna get all of these um, documents via email when Jennifer sends out the link for the webinar. And then you would wanna meet with your decision makers and then persist and win. So find supporters. Um, when we have given these workshops to people who want to expand their paid family policies, we want we always encourage them to not just 
befriend other people who are in who are pregnant or who have young children but we really encourage them to talk to anybody and build an alliance with people who may be giving uh, providing caregiving support and we know that that's like a very vulnerable and personal thing that may not be um, obvious um, but talking about it can help people open up about like oh yeah I actually need caregiving leave as well um, I'm not a caregiver. I haven't been one yet. Um, so I think I look to you all to see like, how do you, do, do people bring it up in your workplaces? Um, and I think it varies. Like if your workplace is very friendly and you get along with your coworkers, you're maybe more inclined to talk about this. But if your workplace isn't as friendly, then um, it may be more difficult. But definitely sharing your own experiences has a lot of power. Um, and then this is a quote from one of the folks that we helped set, um, share, which is that we presented strong data, but what changed our CEO's opinion on paid family leave was hearing powerful stories from employees about their experiences from lack of good policy. I, I believe some, I saw somewhere that like, you know, caregivers are often maybe like going in late to work or leaving early or missing hours. Um, if you, if like people can share, like I had to stay home a little, you know, I had to stay up late last, last night and do X, Y, Z. Like there's just like, those are very compelling human experiences that can change people's hearts really um, about like the need for caregiving leave. I want to stress too that that can be done and should be done at any level you have within your company, whether you're, you know, just starting there. Um, and you want to keep the conversation more private between coworkers that you're getting to know, but particularly people that have um, a higher supervisory role within their employ employer um, structure. Because um, I read a statistic, I think um, from Harvard, that millennial caregivers, th those that leave their jobs, are most likely to have a higher title. Um, it was 61% were at like um, a strong supervisory role. In their company and a lot of times people feel vulnerable admitting their caregiving responsibilities outside of work because they think either nobody relates people think they're distracted but because they haven't seen a top-down approach that um, somebody who's their senior at the office has taken that caregiving leave so they feel intimidated to do it themselves and to use that benefit so I encourage anybody you know really rethink your position at work and um, the role that you could set by um, speaking to others and advocating for family leave. I didn't know that. That's really good to know. We should include that in our in our citations. <laughs> we have a citation stack here, so we're you know there's so much data now coming out, which is really good. Um, cool. The other thing that I mentioned early that you'd want to do is to power map. So this is a very basic power map uh, diagram. Basically, there's two axes. There's like who people in your organiz or company who have power, decision-making power, um, and then there's people who don't have any decision-making power. And then on the x-axis, you have people who strongly disagree, who would oppose expanding a paid family policy, and on the other side, you have people who would be supportive of that. So you'd want to map and see who in your org company has uh, power, who, who has like, a decision making power and who also strongly agrees and also figure out if there's ways to move people who may be like on the strongly disagree or like less powerful um, to move them forward and move them up and to build that alliance um, but when you're doing the power mapping you also want to be thinking about the following questions which are what do we want um, what policy are you asking for um, and also like you want to I already went through like who has power and who has decision um, who has decision making power and who strongly agrees um, you also want to ask like who do they listen to because those are the people that you want to also be collaborating with and what do they care about so if there's like a CEO who cares about like productivity that's when you can show them the research and the case that like having a a comprehensive paid family policy and that's one that includes caregiving leave is actually really good for like productivity um, and then what are the most what are they most proud of regarding the company a lot of companies will say we value families that's actually like a big thing and we value um, 
respect or we value, I don't know, integrity. Well, ensuring that people have time to take care of their loved ones is a way to show employees respect and there is integrity in that. So, you know, use whatever values your company has to like say like this policy has all of the values that we like believe in. Um, and if you sign up for like one-on-one -on -one coaching with us, um, you can ask more questions and we can have like a more tailored discussion, but this is a basic element of a power map. Um, we will also send a customized proposal. Um, so the contents of this, and you can see in the image here at the bottom of the screen, bottom right corner of the screen, what a proposal looks like. And the, the sections include like having a strong opening and ask. That's when you can include, that's where you can include a story. The why statement um, can have like statistics and other data that's relevant. The employee testimonials, that's when you can like work with other um, coworkers and see if there's like something that they would want to share and, you know, to support expanding their paid leave policy. Uh, you would want to have the current policy as it stands right now. If there isn't one, then you would say that there isn't one. And you would want to also benchmark competitor policies. I'm going to get into that in the next slide. And then you would want to have at the end the policy that you propose. I have a question. Yes. Um, looking at this proposal, I think it's incredible, but I would be completely intimidated to hand this to an employer, um, to my employer. Or if I worked at something that's my experience in television is that these are major corporations that I've worked for, but they don't necessarily feel like that when you walk in and things feel a bit more casual and people would look at a memo and think like, what is this? <laughs> so is there a conversation that you can have to kind of introduce this, um, this printed proposal? Yeah. So here are some of the things that other, other people have done when they start this, like there's usually one, one or two individuals who start this proposal and they share it with each other. And I've seen other people create, like depending on the size of the company, some people have created a task force around it. So like, it's not just one person going to a CEO or like someone in leadership and saying like, Hey, we want to change our proposal, like our paid family policy here. It's also like people coming together and like building off of that. Um, which makes it like more powerful because the more people you have on your team, like the more willing, I think the more uh, persistent you know, like people can be. Mm. Um, so it's not always a, like a one-on-one -on -one conversation and that one-on-one -on -one conversation may take time. Um, I've seen people who, who shared the proposal with an HR person or the leader in their organization um, and then said, okay, I'm going to talk to the CEO and get back to you and see what they think. Um, so conversations, I, I, this is where we kind of leave it to people to gauge and like do a little bit of a gut check to see like what they think is best to like the, the best way to approach this. Um, but we definitely don't encourage people to, you know, for someone to just have a meeting, a one-on-one -on -one meeting with the CEO um, and share this because that can definitely be intimidating and it can also backfire. Um, so part of this is also like creating the team that you need to support what's going to be in there because it's essentially going to impact every employee at your workplace. So it'd be nice to have input from all of them or a lot of them. Great. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Okay. I mentioned benchmarking um, and benchmarking essentially means like checking what other competitors are doing. I'll say that most of the companies that are changing expanding their paid family policies are in the Silicon Valley, at least that I know of. Um, that's like a big benefit that they're offering. And so like it's become easier for them to like compare like, oh, Google offers this, but Facebook and F Facebook offers that. And we're, I don't know, we're a startup too. And we should be up, up there with these, with these companies. Um, however, I also, we also invite people to think outside of like their industry and compare um, company size. So if there's somebody who works in, let's see, in, in the medical fields um, at a small hospital or a clinic, 
you can still compare maybe to like a smaller, uh, an organization who has the same number or similar number of employees um, to do that benchmarking. Also, it, you can benchmark by like um, the services that you provide or by city and county. I've seen other people do that even by state. So um, just because there's like, they're completely different industries doesn't mean that you can't compare what like people in that region are offering in terms of paid family policies. So there's a lot of ways of like breaking this up. Um, you'll see in the screen that there's like a little example. And I mentioned like the, there's like Lyft, Walmart, Dow Jones. Um, and like there's a column that has industry and the, the paid family policies uh, by type. Um, so that's something that you can do. And I, I'm not sure why that one, I think that also had to do with, um, anyways, there's like different ways of doing your benchmarking. And that's something that we can help with. Um, it's kind of difficult to give like a, a, an example when there isn't one to, um, to exercise on. So like if you want to chat more with us and like help with benchmarking, there's benchmarking, then there, there are ways that we can um, organize it so that it's, it's a, it has purpose and that it's beneficial to your proposal. Cool. So now we can go into, no, here, it always skips the slide. Um, so we went over some of the tools and resources that you can use to propose your paid family policy at your workplace. Um, I'll just share again that at the end of this um, webinar, you're going to get the recording. Um, we'll send over a paid family leave workshop toolkit, the customizable proposal. We also have a frequently asked questions link where um, a lot of the questions that people have um, are in that, um, in that link. And of course, you're all invited to join the Caregiver Collective Facebook group, um, which is a social support group uh, for millennial caregivers. Jennifer, do you want to say more about that? Sure, everybody that's participating live at the moment is already a Caregiver Collective member. <laughs> but for people that watch this going forward and feel like they need a place or are looking for a place or would just like a place um, to connect as a millennial caregiver, um, Caregiver Collective, the way that people have come together, I've been so impressed by the membership um, of people reaching out to each other. So we'd be happy for anybody um, who fits our demographic or, you know, relates to us to come join us on Facebook. Awesome. I see a question, so I'll pause. It's Rachel saying it's such a great group. Oh, so <laughs> <Thank> good. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, and if you're interested in signing up for coaching to actually go through these steps in more detail and, um, you know, in a way that it's more that's more personalized to your situation, you can email me at fabiola at paidleave.us and we can schedule a 30 minute consultation and talk about that. Is there a fee for that, Fabiola? Oh no, this is no, this is complimentary. Um, that's part of what we would we were doing with the workshops that we were giving before. We would give people like 30 minute consultations and um, talk through like their questions and also like troubleshoot any parts of like the proposal that they had. Um, they needed help with and we've had some we've had definitely several wins I mean so the overall we've helped over close to six million people when paid family leave in their workplaces which is really awesome um, and then I don't know the exact number for like the small medium-sized businesses but for sure last year we had um, quite a few wins um, we also have a medium page you know the the blog page um, where some of the people who won their paid family leave uh, policies at their workplaces shared what that process was like. So you're invited to also check that out to see like how people have won and how it's made an impact. Great. And Fabiola, you've mentioned to me before that some of these companies that you've worked with are major corporations that um, you've been successful in changing the policy. And so um, I think that's so awesome, but also I'm sharing that because I don't want people to feel intimidated that they work for some, you know, beast of an industry that won't listen because uh, we see more and more that, you know, if you, if you're loud and push hard enough, um, changes can be made. Yeah. And we definitely want to respect where people are in their comfort level. Like it's, there's no point in, in, you know, 
in pushing anyone to want to change their pay, like in wanting to do, to do that because it takes a lot of energy. It really does. I mean, we're here to support um, and we're here to help with that process whenever people are ready. Um, but yeah, it's, we're kind of just like on the outside um, encouraging people to do that, but not pressuring people to do it if it's not something that they want to do yet. Great. Yeah. And um, there's a question from Zach regarding your consultations. He's asking if you've ever provided that service to HR departments or just to employees. So most of the people who have attended our webinars are actually HR leaders. Um, and we, we have a, um, a Rolodex of HR professionals who have come on as guest speakers during some of our web webinars who can share more like of what the process of implementing a policy, a new policy has been. Um, and we can definitely get like, if it's, if we think it's a good match, we'll, we can get people in touch with the HR professionals that we know um, to walk through this process. And that's like part, like would be part two of the consultation. Like if we, you, most people usually come to us with like a proposal that they've already drafted and then like have key questions um, that they want to work through and we support with that. And if we think that there's like, there's a promising outcome, meaning that like it'll likely, you know, HR or the CEOs and leadership will be um, supportive of that, then we'd want to connect them with an HR person. Actually, that's happened. I think that one of the most common questions that um, HR leaders come back with, at least like for people who are trying to change the policies, is like, well, how much is this going to cost? Hmm. Oh, and I actually have to include that in the uh, resources to share. We have a cost calculator. We're not, expert, we're not HR experts, and we're not trying to be but we do have people who have that expertise who can talk more about the cost and how to implement it so that it benefits the business and um, employees. Um, so I'll send that link as well, I'll include it. Let me write it down before I forget. Um, cost calculator. Yeah, so um, you know, if there are more technical questions, then like we can definitely connect people with an HR person. Um, and if there's, there are HR people who wanna learn more about this, then like this is a great way to also like, um, bring together the HR community. Uh, it's something that we've also been having, you know, we've had interest in doing. Zach said that's fantastic. Also, I'd like to chime in for any HR person that's listening is that the um, Harvard Business School study on caregivers in, in, in the workplace found that when you offer telecommuting and flexible schedules to caregivers, for every dollar that the business puts in, um, to those services, they have a major return on investment that's double to quadruple um, to keep caregivers working. That's cool. I clearly read a lot of studies. No. <laughs> I mean, you need, you need to equip yourself with these tools. Yeah, that's, uh, we have way too many on my, I think sometimes um, it's really hard to like fester it. But yeah, no, that's really good to know as well. I'd love to like get your, your little, um, <laughs> Your, your pile of research that you have, it'll help us. And those are the things that we need to, you know, be sharing because that's evidence. And like, we always want to show that there, the evidence already exists. Cool. Okay, so now we can go into some resources and services for caregivers. And this is more just in case you, you, um, you need it. And um, this can also be a chance for people on the call to share any other services that you all have accessed. Um, I can speak mostly to the first one, Ionic Care. Ionic stands for I am not alone. Um, and basically they help people coordinate uh, practical support, communicate updates, and ensure that you're not alone. It's, it's an, a phone app where you can coordinate meals, transportation, child pickup, schedule a break, all that kind of stuff kind of reminds me of meal train where you can just like people can sign up to bring you a meal. Um, but this is obviously tailored for caregivers. So there's, it's more expansive. I've also heard of wealthy and that, and they help people coordinate care for aging and chronically ill or disabled, um, uh, family members. Um, yeah, so they, they, there are a lot of services like this out there is what I've become aware of. Um, caring transition, they specifically help settle, help people settle their parents into assisted living facilities or deal with possessions after they pass away. So that's also more tailored for people who are like at the end of life stage. Um, the other service or 
thing that I want people to be aware of is that at least in California, we have what is called kin care. And that allows employees to use up half of their accrued sick leave benefits to care for an immediate family member or domestic partner. Um, I don't know what the case is for like other states. We know that Hawaii also has some of these um, family leave benefits, but this is also to encourage you to maybe like see what other um, benefits and resources your state or even your city offers. Did you wanna add anything? Okay, there's a question, so I'll pause there. Sure, um, Rachel said, be careful because certain state programs have strict eligibility requirements. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, yeah, I think um, to that point, um, there are people that you can usually speak to um, if you have the, um, the I'm, I'm on so much allergy medication, I'm blanking on the name of the office, but the office that deals with, um, yes, thank you, Rachel. The um, Area Agency on Aging, thank you, oh. that is what I was thinking of. Okay. Um, that they're usually very helpful state to state and to speak to somebody who's um, very well versed in all of these programs, find out eligibility. Um, New York State has something where um, you can be paid for your caregiving through New York State. I know that that is a great option if you have to leave work or find yourself a full-time caregiver. But I know at our age as millennials, we don't wanna to have to sacrifice a career. Um, and so it's a great benefit if you have to be there full time, but it's, you know, paid family leave is obviously so critical in helping us to keep our jobs and continue building our careers. Um, Rachel said she suggests the aging and disability resource, resource centers and highly recommends connecting with other family caregivers at caregiving.com. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, those are great. Um, uh, I'll say that for Ayana Care, it was also started by a person who provided care to um, their parent who also and passed away. Um, so, you know, some of these, I, I, I always, I, I like to caution people to like, be careful, like what kind of services are out there, because I think that sometimes like, they're not, um, they can come from people who don't have that experience. And it's, you can feel the difference and see the difference when like services and um, resources come from people who have had that lived experience um, because they're just more tailored to those needs. So yeah, just welcome people to check out and see what else is out there for yourselves. I checked out Ayana Care's website and it looked like a great platform. Um, I was pretty impressed with it. Um, I was posting to it to the care about it to the Caregiver Collective page. I know that a few members said that they've downloaded it. So if anybody has experience with that, with Ayana Care, Wealthy, or any of these other um, apps or online programs, you know, please share your experience because it can only help benefit others who could also use that program or act as a cautionary tale not to. Um, yeah. It's incredibly helpful. Yeah, we're in touch with the person who started Ayana Care. So like if you have any feedback, I know that they would be thrilled to hear about it. Um, just because we know them like that they had, you know, had to provide caregiving leave as well. So um, anyway, yes, everything that Jennifer said. <laughs> awesome. Okay, so um, I'd like to share a little bit about what like we've done to get to our win. Um, our, again, our goal is to win paid family by 2022. And so like that means we're often moving really quickly um, and we're just doing, we're doing a lot. And we're a relatively small team. We're a team of about 12, 12 members and we have like consultants um, throughout the country. Uh, so we stay busy. But some of the things that have led to our successes are we help people launch campaigns by starting a petition. I mentioned earlier that uh, we worked with our Walmart and um, a few mothers like started a petition and shared about um, their experiences as new parents um, at Walmart and also kind of like the difficulties of not, I think these two, these two women went back to work within 10 days of giving birth, which is another statistic that is heartbreaking in, in, in this industrialized country. Um, so that's something that has been, good for us to launch petition against like corporations. Um, we've also had people share their experiences with members of Congress. 
So actually one of the advocates from our Walmart um, went to a subcommittee hearing in July in DC and met with um, Jimmy Gomez. And Jimmy Gomez is a Congress member from California. He's been championing the California Paid Family Leave Program, um, increase the wage replacement and hopes to do something more at the federal level. Um, so it's been also nice to build those that like that um, allyship with them. Um, calling or emailing representatives is like a very basic and very common thing that we do, especially with a lot of bills being introduced right now. Um, and actually to that point, most of the bills that have been introduced have failed to include caregiving leave. They are mostly focused on parental leave. Um, and so that's why we've at PLUS have made an effort to really uplift and highlight the need for caregiving leave. So we had um, one of the, our members uh, start a petition a couple, a few weeks ago when Rubio introduced his bill um, and she basically started a petition asking him to like include, asking members of Congress, not him, um, to only support a bill that includes caregiving leave. Um, she was a caregiver and she's, she's also pregnant. She's actually due uh, later this year. So, you know, just it, for her, it's important to have both. Um, the other thing that people have done is talk to media and press about their experiences and we know that, you know, not everybody is comfortable with that. Media can be intimidating. Um, and also like, again, people's personal stories are personal and they, they can be, you know, a vulnerable thing to share. So we don't encourage everyone or anyone to do it unless they're really comfortable. But we have seen some people's um, stories be shared on different outlets. Um, and what that does is that it helps paint a different picture um, of what is needed and who is being left out. Oftentimes reporters want to hear stories from people who, who don't, who we don't hear from. Um, so it can be a good experience. Whenever that does happen, we have a really strong communications department here at PLUS, so we don't throw anyone just in front of a reporter or to be interviewed. We definitely prep them and make sure that they feel comfortable um, when they talk to, to the press or the media. Again, because any bill that is proposed is going to go through different hearings and different committees and subcommittees, um, we'll definitely be attending the bigger ones. We'll probably we'll have lobby days to attend and different actions. Um, so right now we have a membership list of about seventy thousand, um, and hopefully growing because we'll just we'll need that people power to show uh, members of Congress that people care about this issue. And if you're interested in like just getting more updates, you can join at paidleave.us. Any questions about this or comments? While people are thinking if they have any questions, I'll watch the, the comment box here. Um, I would just like to really stress the importance of knowing your candidates and representatives um, stance on paid family leave for caregivers. Um, as Fabiola mentioned, you know, to have it be inclusive of caregivers. Right now, Rubio's um, program, you know, care and caregiving is left out of that. And, and whenever it's brought up, it's said that it will be, that this parental leave is a stepping stone and that these other, you know, pieces to incorporate will come as the policy gets built. And when I hear that, I just think if there are 40 million plus caregivers in the United States, why are we waiting? You know, we should have a policy right now that incorporates family caregiving with parental leave, maternity and paternity leave. Um, so I really stress we're such a generation of advocates. Um, we have a bad rap, but when you see what's actually going on and the voting trends, it's true. So um, this has a potential to really catch the eye of a lot of people, particularly running for president. Um, with Kirsten Gillibrand in that mix. She's been a proponent of caregiving being included in paid family leave for years. And I think that because she's so vocal about it, Fabiola and I have talked about how that will encourage other candidates to also incorporate paid family leave, um, which some already have to include caregiving. Um, so, you know, please just look at when you vote, when you are reaching out to candidates, which you know can just be like a postcard or however you feel comfortable, you know, know their stance, know how you can get involved and make it clear that this is something that's important to you if it is. 
Yep. Did I see some questions or comments in the chat? Um, let's see. Thank you for all of that, Jennifer. Oh, sure. That's, that's my little yeah. <laughs> um, high horse getting involved politically. <laughs> important. Um, Rachel says, I just want to say thank you to Jennifer and Fabiola. This is so wonderful that you put this info together for us. I'm getting ready for my blog anniversary at takingcareofgrandma.com. And every mm -hmm. single millennial I've interviewed so far has left the corporate world because of this issue. I'm going to talk about it on May Day. Thank you so, oh, so much. That's, that's awesome. Great. Please feel free to share with us. Um, we post a ton of stuff on our social media. So like if we can amplify that, we would love to. Um, yeah. So Jennifer, you're, you're the, the, um, the contact person. So <laughs> yeah, let us know when to share, how to share all that stuff. We would be thrilled to do that. Yeah. And also Rachel, I hope that these people are also, um, involved in caregiver collective because we need these voices mm -hmm. um, to, you know, share experiences just even among our membership. Mm -hmm. Um, Zach mentioned, have you consider, um, oh, that's where they came from. Great. <laughs> I'm glad we're connecting people. Um, have you considered working with large advocacy groups in the caregiving industry, such as Healthcare of America? They have political ties and lobby all the time. Many of these members have employees who are caregivers for others as well as for themselves. Yeah, most of our, the relationship building that we've been focusing on has been with other organizations, mostly nonprofits who are doing um, work around caregiving. So I mentioned earlier that we are, um, we'll be collaborating with Caring Across Generations. Um, really encourage you all to also check them out. They, yeah, they're, they're exclusively focused on caregiving, but I don't, I thank you for sharing healthcare of America. I don't think that we've done that. And we do have a, a person on staff who is leading, um, basically what we call like partners and influencers. And yeah, if like they have like a big, big advocacy arm and they're doing that, like that's exactly what we want to do is to join forces with other companies, organizations, like really just bringing all kinds of stakeholders together. Um, you know, advocates, like caregiver collective, like that's going to be, that's going to, you know, we want to elevate all of this and make sure that when we need to like shout loudly that um, we have all the power that we need and all the voices that we need. And that includes business, business leaders who are changing their policies. So we're thinking everything and everyone. So thank you for sharing that. I'll flag that to um, the person that's taking the lead on that. Yeah. Do I see other comments or? Uh, yeah, he says, I know someone on their board if you need help to connect. Okay. And this is Zach. Yes, and I have his contact information. Okay, cool. Well, there'll be a lot of follow-up emails to, <laughs> to do after this. Cool. Um, yeah, always feel free. Um, you can join us at Paid Leave. You can just connect with Jennifer. Jennifer and I are in close communication, so that's probably the easiest and best thing to do. Um, yeah, so thank you all for that. And then, you know, we only have a couple minutes left, and I don't think we'll really have time to discuss this, but these are some of the questions that, um, I have been reflecting on or thinking about as we are working with caregivers more. Um, and maybe it'll be good for you all to reflect. I'm not sure like if caregiver, I know you have like, I think, is it a monthly call or something like that? I'm or sorry. do you oh, have a support call? Support call. We do. Uh, we haven't had one this month because um, I was helping to pull together this webinar and wanted to make sure people um, got the information and weren't bombarded by oh. two things at once. Yeah. But um, we do have a monthly um, via Zoom support chat for um, people to connect face to face uh, in our respective states and countries. Um, so yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, well, I mean, these are some questions that I think from like a, like a, I guess, campaign standpoint, I'd love to know more about because I think that there's still more that I need to learn. And I, I mean, you know, what, like, what are some barriers, barriers to policy advocacy? I know that people who are giving caregiving support are often strapped on time. They already have their jobs and providing care. So like to do any kind of policy advocacy, even if that's just like signing an email, I mean, a petition can sometimes be like, I, I don't need to do that. Um, so yeah, I'm just trying to think of like how we can also be supportive and more understanding and accessible to um, communities who need this the most. Um, I've also thought of, uh, been thinking a lot about people who have access needs, um, specifically like people in the who have disabilities and 
how we're including their voices and their stories in, in our, in this paid family leave de debate. Um, you know, people, they they have families, they have lives, they need to thrive as well. And they uh, deserve, everybody deserves to be with their loved ones when it, they need it the most. So we, I'm also trying to, un, you know, understand how we can, we can be at plus a more accessible organization. Um, and one of the things that's important to me is also making sure that when people share their stories, um, that they're driving the narrative. Um, oftentimes, I've you know I've seen when um, Jennifer, we've kind of a little bit discussed about this that you know sometimes it can seem, especially in, in like policy work, that there's just an interest in like using someone's story um, and then like disposing of them or like not talking to them again. And I'm very, um, I do not support that. So I'm also wanting to see like, would, there, would it be helpful to have like a storytelling, um, like training so that people can own their stories and start thinking like, what is it that you would want to share and make sure that it's something empowering and something that feels good to you and not just something that like an organization or an elected official or um, somebody with decision-making power wants to hear. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So anyway, those are questions that um, I've been trying to discuss. <laughs> mm -hmm. I would love to hear from you all. And maybe you, you can have that at your next uh, monthly call. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think what you're talking about and owning your stories is so important. Um, you know, caregiving is becoming a bigger and busier business as people find themselves to be caregivers more and more. Um, and we're more vocal about it maybe than in the past. And so there are people like you mentioned who maybe don't have the experience themselves who are now find themselves in this as an industry. Um, and so one thing I've really tried to do is maintain the integrity of Caregiver Collective as a support chat, um, online chat, a support group, um, because we have so many people who try to capitalize on it. Um, like. Fabiola mentioned can happen when you incorporate business into this. So um, if there is a way yeah, to help educate people on, on when you feel comfortable sh sharing your story, whether it's just with friends or it's, you know, on a wider stage, how to do that in a way that feels good to you. Because if it doesn't, you know, you don't want to get hurt, you know, emotionally doing this. It's hard enough emotionally. <laughs> so I think that's, that's a great idea. Um, Zach says, as a former HR exec, I really love and appreciate what you're doing. And thanks, Jennifer, for making this happen. You're welcome, Zach. <laughs> Glad you joined us. Um, another suggestion may be to help employees create employee resource group for employee caregivers. And they can help advocate this with the proposal and getting in front of decision makers in large numbers. I think that's a great suggestion. Awesome. That's cool. Well, I know we're a little bit over time and I want to be mindful of everyone's time. So unless there are any other burning questions, oh, we can end it here. Um, and always feel free to reach out to, to us. And of course, Jennifer, again, Jennifer and I are connected. So you can always reach, reach me via Jennifer. <laughs> <laughs> and cool. thank you so much a, for everybody joining us today. Um, I hope that this was helpful for you. And thank you for your questions and comments. And Fabiola, really like everything you're doing at Paid Leave US is so huge for the country. And um, this was tailored specifically for our membership, um, people that are millennials dealing with caregiving. And um, there's not much out there like that. So really, thank you for this. It's an incredible resource. Yeah, thank you all. Cool. Okay, I'm gonna stop and then end our, our video. And you'll get all these resources um, in an email. Great. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. <laughs>